And Jared, would you mind starting us off with a prayer? On yeah, 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 I can do that. Thank you. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for um, all the provisions you've made through this time of uncertainty as we um, try to get our things together uh, to come and uh, finish off this year strong uh, with professionalism and um, just a few slip-ups. Father, we uh, just pray that this evening goes uh, well and with no te technological issues um, and that we can uh, just uh, be grateful for the opportunity we get to meet as a department um, and to uh, share our successes of this year and of our careers. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for that, Jared. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to this celebration. We've never done this before, uh, so it could go a lot of different ways. Uh, we did a rehearsal, so we're hoping it goes pretty well. Our only practice at doing this besides our rehearsal is our classes and students you may give us lower grades than we give you when it comes to how we performed uh, in synchronous and asynchronous classes during the, the time of coronavirus which is how my my journalists are, are writing headlines these days so we just want to thank you guys for showing up for this um, there's nothing we can do to make up for the fact that you can't be on campus and we can't celebrate you with big hugs but Virtually, you know, all my students know how I love hugs. And we're just gonna have to do it virtually and we're gonna try to celebrate some of the, the best moments that we as faculty could think of. And there are many more and we can't thank everybody. We can't hit all the important moments, but we're just gonna hit a few. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at a couple department highlights. Many of our classes were very memorable, whether they happened in the classroom, uh, virtually, or whether they happened abroad. So we're gonna highlight a couple of those now. I was the um, leader of this fine group of students that went to England this fall. We spent um, the semester in England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and the north of France. And you can see here some really excellent Regency dancing that we did with the Jane Austen dancers in Salisbury. In Digital News Studio, I was really, this is the class I was most worried about because I didn't know how we were going to do stories go out in the world and do stories when we couldn't go out in the world. But they found ways to do that. And here's just a piece of one of those stories. I think a silver lining for Corona has been. I think that people are like, like the worst in people and some people it's coming out but i think the best in people and some people it's coming out as well it gives me and people in general time to actually look at themselves i think getting unexpected time with family it gives people an opportunity to be very introspective and i think that's a great thing i've been able to like just reflect a lot a really nice silver lining is that I've actually gotten to sleep a lot. <laughs> so they found ways to do stories and I was really proud of them. This is Writer's Workshop. After our, everyone created these amazing projects, at the end of Interim, we did a tour of the Loft Literary Center, which just a, it's a wonderful place to go for writers in the uh, Twin Cities. In poetry writing, uh, we do readings in the library, whether it's spring or fall. So poetry writing was in the fall, uh, fall 2019. And uh, this is our uh, poster for the reading. We launched a new class this year called Story in Modern America. And um, one of the projects that students did was a podcast project. So this is a little promotion for the MSP Modern Story podcast. Um, different groups of students did some great work on podcasts and we were averaging almost 100 listeners or 100 downloads per podcast. Um, so it was a great start to what we hope will be a course that will last a long time. Yeah, so take that Joe Heaty and Josh Towner. And you guys are seeing a lot of um, 
links on this presentation. When this presentation is over, you'll be able to jump on any of these links and take your time with any of these classes or any of these projects. Uh, principles of editing. We had uh, 11 students going to Maxfield Elementary. This is, I think, the fourth year that we uh, uh, did that. So we produced a newspaper with tons of stories, photos, and we were able to deliver the paper to the students. I think we made 1,000 copies and we delivered these papers to the students so they can uh, they could bring this home back to their friends, their parents uh, uh, um, uh, before the end of the semester. So that was really a success. Professor Larson and I trade off teaching a gen ed course in Islamic literature and culture. Uh, students study the history of Islam. They read Quran and fiction written by Muslims and spend some time with Muslims in the Twin Cities. This student tutored a Somali elder last fall in one of the high rises in Minneapolis. In interim, uh, we took our Textura brand, which uh, traveled to Guatemala three years ago. And we, went, we traveled all the way across the globe to India, where it was a lot colder than we expected. And the, the stories that we found there were both social justice stories and cultural stories. And we tried to, tried to find the dignity in all the people that we found. And the products coming out of that class will be an um, a internet documentary, um, a hard copy magazine. And we are releasing that digitally right now on issue, which you can see all the pages. And on Instagram, the students did a takeover. And we also have all the, all the products at sikdikstura.com. And we also put together, uh, Abby or Ali O'Neill put together a credits video so you can get a taste for what it looked like over in India. magazine will be available in the fall for purchase and all proceeds will go to our sources and groups that help our sources in India. So now we want to talk about some highlights beyond the classroom. Our students are very active both in the class and outside the classroom. Oh, the Koyumo Literary Journal. Uh, we had another successful year for fall 2019. Our head editors as well as our staff uh, were Tatiana Lee and Haley Sawyer. They did a wonderful job. The cover art was done by Mary Hitt and Sierra Smith. And for spring uh, 2020, uh, we were very uh, happy to have Tatiana Lee come back as a head editor and Diana Clark joined her. We have uh, graduating seniors. Uh, they had uh, a wonderful staff this time, uh, and they were also able to uh, do something that we hadn't done before, and that's to put the, uh, the journal on YouTube. So if you have not heard uh, the literary reading, please go to YouTube and listen to the reading, and there's a PDF also of the text. And that's available on this link. 
The Bethel Clarion had a very good year led by Jasmine Johnson and Josh Towner. Uh, they had to deal with uh, constant stories about cuts and then they had to deal with the coronavirus and had to change how they did business. And I would argue that they came together even more once they stopped uh, staying up late at night, missing deadline, uh, late into the night so that they could make deadline the next morning. And once they went online, they became even a more cohesive group, which is really a testament to all the editors. And they created new products such as a daily podcast and uh, news students could use in a compilation called The Egg. Here's a taste of one of those podcasts. Welcome to Life Is, a podcast from the award-winning Bethel University Clarion. I'm co-host Zach Walker. And I'm co-host Abby Pouts. Today, Life Is Leadership. We'll talk about online physics labs, mission trip cancellations, and why Zach hates Texas Toast. We'll discuss digital newsrooms, leaders who make mistakes, and all-star McDonald's mascot Grimace. And even though we're supposed to be talking about leadership, we'll probably lecture about other things and maybe talk to some folks over at the award-winning Clarion Newsroom. Because life is leadership, but life is everything else too. Life is. Life is drops now. <laughs> The Clarion also um, has decided to go in a new direction. Uh, for the first time, the Clarion is gonna run all summer and keep its website going. This is partially due to a lack of internships available to journalists. So the Johnson Center is kicking in money to make this happen. So the summer editors will be Will Jaycott, a graphic design major from Oatana. He will be the managing editor. And the editor will be Molly Korzanowski, a, a she will be a senior journalism and graphic design major uh, who also served as a news editor and was the editor of Textura. She will be the editor-in-chief. We're very excited about that. So give them congratulations when you see them or when you see them online. Then the editors for the school year were named. Molly will stay on as managing editor throughout the school year. And in the fall, the editor will be Emma Harville, um, who was our lifestyles editor. She will be a senior from Circle Pines, Minnesota. And Zach Walker will be the spring editor when he comes back from Oregon on a writing semester there. Uh, he's from Baldwin and he's been our project and lifestyles editor. So please congratulate them and feed them story ideas and follow the clarion all summer. So now we wanna celebrate all of our graduating seniors and you will hear from the professors who are working in those programs, depending on their major. So here we go. Sierra Bilby is a um, communication arts and literature education major as well as an English literature major and she is from Lina Lakes, Minnesota. Maddie Christie is a missional ministries and journalism major. Um, she is from the metropolis of Orange City, Iowa. Aunt Diana Clark comes to us from Waukee, Iowa, and she is also a communication arts and literature education major, as well as a major in English literature. Hunter Hill from Kinney, Minnesota is a double major in philosophy and English literature. Joe Heedy is a journalism major from Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. Kate Holstein comes to us from Rockford, Illinois, and she is a communication arts and literature education major. Eleanor Jones Rarick is from Carver, Minnesota and uh, is graduating with degrees in English literature and writing, as well as minors in theater and digital film and video for actors. Jasmine Johnson is a journalism major with a graphic design minor. She is from Becker, Minnesota. Tatiana Lee is a journalism major with a minor in creative writing. 
and she's from Woodbury, Minnesota. Bethany Lopez Luna from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota is graduating with a degree in English literature and writing. Jared Martinson will graduate as a journalism major with a minor in media production, and he's from Maple Grove, Minnesota. Rebecca Nyaccio is from Dayton, Ohio, and she is an English literature major. Haley Sorer is from Orono, Minnesota, and she also is an English literature major. John Smith is a communication arts and literature education major, and he is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Anita Stassen from Apple Valley, Minnesota, with degrees in uh, English literature and writing and digital humanities, as well as a minor in business. Josh Towner came to us from Carpentersville, Illinois, and he will graduate with a major in journalism and a minor in media production. Alina Yermakovich comes from Albertville, Minnesota, and she is also a communication arts and literature education major. Catherine Young from St. Paul, Minnesota, graduating with a degree in English literature and writing. Great. We want to thank all of our seniors. Um, we're going to miss them like crazy, and it's been unfortunate that we've had to already miss them for more than a month, for a couple months. And you can look forward to a surprise coming in the mail, courtesy of our faculty, and in particular, Dr. Susan Brooks. So next, we would like to hand out our department awards. Um, the, these student awards were made possible by donations to our department from our extended Bethel family. So our first award is the John and Ethel Lee Journalism Scholarship. This scholarship is given to a student who shows interest in proficiency in journalism and proceeds are from the Martin Erickson Memorial Scholarship Fund. And that winner goes, that will be income, she will be a senior and that is Laura Osterland. Laura comes to us from White Bear Lake and she is a journalism major with a minor in media production. She's also a clarion reporter and videographer, and she spent fall of 2019 in Segovia, Spain on a study abroad, but she returned to school this spring and blended in seamlessly back with her clarion family. The next award is the Jean and Kathy Johnson Award. The Jean and Kathy Johnson from the Johnson Center uh, which is led by Dave Kansas of American Public Media and Minnesota Public Radio. And the Johnson Award goes to a student who has just been especially valuable to the program throughout the year. And that winner of the Jean and Kathy Johnson Award goes to, and she wasn't an insider for this, Jasmine Johnson. You can see Jasmine when she came to the My Media Workshop as a little kid got sold on Bethel, and now she's leaving, and look how exhausted she is on the right. <laughs> she was a key player for us in the uh, Textura trip to India, uh, reported big stories, and um, held devotionals along with Maddie Christie to keep that staff together. She was one of the, really the glue of that team. And she's also, uh, with Josh Towner, the glue of the clarion itself. And she does journalism for all the right reasons, and we're all very proud of her. So congratulations to Jasmine, who's here. So we can all snap for her or clap for her. And her next award. So the Wines Award is um, uh, more of a literary award given in honor of Dr. Christian Weitz, who was a beloved professor in the English department for 25 years and uh, well regarded by alumni and professors. Uh, and this award is generally given to a senior student who's shown um, uh, particularly uh, good sort of scholarly aptitude and uh, also been very significant to the department as a community. 
And this year we have two winners, and our first winner is? Our first winner is Hunter Hill. Um, Hunter is um, marked by, I think, his incredible passion for knowledge uh, in both philosophy and literary study, and also a guy who will absolutely go anywhere to learn anything he wants to know. Um, to the point of deciding to study Indian philosophy and the next thing I know he's figured out ways to go to India and study Sanskrit. Um, so uh, he's been a, a, a delight, I think, to all of his instructors uh, the whole time he's been here. Um, and so I'm very, very pleased that the, the department uh, grants him this award. Let's hear it for Hunter. And the second Wentz Award goes to? The second award goes to Anita Stassen. Um, Anita has been a really important part of our department. She has been an England term student. She's done a really fantastic internship. She's worked on the Coeval um, and she's been um, a regular enterer of the Jerry Healy Poetry Prize. And I, having Anita along on England term was just lovely. Um, she is someone who is curious. She loves learning. Um, and, you know, this, this might be a surprise to some, but sometimes grading papers gets a little tedious. And I would put Anita's paper kind of like in the middle because her, I knew her paper was going to be something interesting that would really um, make me think. And that was true every time. And that's true, not just for me, but for many for my colleagues as well. So congratulations, Anita. We are just so happy that you've been a part of our English department family for these last few years. Fantastic. And now we're to the Jerry Healy Poetry Prize. The Jerry Healy Poetry Prize has been created in honor of the late Gerald Healy, former Bethel professor of English uh, by his family. The top six finalist poems are featured in the spring issue of the Coeval Literary Magazine. The top three poems will receive cash prizes of $200, $100, and $50. Jerry Healy accepted his offer uh, from Bethel College to join their faculty and basketball coaching staff in 1955. Uh, after three years as an assistant coach, he took over the head basketball position and held it until 1966. Jerry started uh, by teaching freshman composition and uh, refresher English. He helped develop the English education program. He supervised student teachers and served as department chair. His favorite was a course on the romantics. Uh, Jerry Hilly passed away on Father's Day in 2016. Upon his death, several memorials were given to Bethel in his honor. His family decided to use that money to underwrite an annual poetry contest for Bethel students. The Jerry Hilly Poetry Prize finalists for 2020 are XL. Sierra Bibli, I Was Too Young, Jamie Hood, Therapy by Ellie Norling, Mother's Medicine by Nita Statson, Stranger's Healing by Macy Voss, and Better Than This by Lily Yigi. And our third place winner is Better Than This by Lily Yegi. Hi, my name's Lily Yegi, and this is my poem, Better Than This. Handshaking, heartbreaking, as I hang up the phone, you deserve better than this. Breath shallow, feels like I'm heading to the gallows as I drive to the hospital, you deserve better than this. Waiting, every second I'm hating as I listen to the doctor's bad news, you deserve better than this. Eyes weeping, anger creeping, as I watch you get lowered into the ground, you deserve better than this. Long nights fighting for what's right as the lawyer looks at me with pity. You deserve better than this. Head spinning, patient spinning as I watch him enter the courtroom. You deserve better than this. All sleep destroyed, I'm suddenly void as I hear him admit to drinking and driving. You deserve better than this. Thinking about him makes me cold, but it's your memory I hold. As I let my heartache grow into resentment and anger, you deserve better than this. A few years later, I have a new neighbor. It's him, out of jail. 
you deserve better than this. Weeks pass, I relapse, and then I remember. You deserve better than this. Inhale, about to bail, as I walk across the street, because you deserve better than this. Ring the bell, this is hell, as he opens the door, and I keep in mind, you deserve better than that. Step inside, put aside my pride, as he talks about how the guilt has been eating him alive, because he knows that you deserve better than that. Never again, he claims, I feel a little shame, as he's a good man and he regrets his actions. We know you deserved better. He wants to take a stand against what he manned, as he doesn't want it to happen to anyone else ever again, because everyone deserves better. His name is Jack, and I decide to go back. As we learn more about each other, I realize he deserved better than that. I don't want our conversations to end. He's become my friend. As I better understand his pain, I realize I'm ready to move on. You deserve better than that. He deserved better than that. So my new friend and I share a smile, the first real one in a while, because can you really heal without learning to forgive? And our second place winner is Exhale by Sierra Bibby. Hi, my name is Sierra Bilby, and I'm going to be reading my poem, Exhale. There are traces of living, this bed unmade and a cereal bowl in the sink, singing barely audible above the shower water and a pair of dirty sneakers that tracked the outside in on the soul, disarrayed pieces of soul. Oh, I've left traces of loving. Songs added to playlists titled with your name, late night phone calls that leave my head buzzing with something like joy, sweetly bruised collarbones tucked under turtlenecks, memories of ice cream cones by the muddy lake shore that blur around the edges. The feeling is strong, but the image grows thin, translucent. There are traces of leaving, forgotten space on social media walls where pictures used to be, silence that burns across distance when there are no words left on the tongue. Songs I can't sing anymore. Space I fear to take up. Wondering how I let myself unlearn so much of me. How I could have left so much of myself behind to be somebody else's drafted artwork. Attempted and discarded. And still there are traces of living. Crumpled up receipts in the center console and open blinds that let light fall dappled on the unmade bed. The cereal bowl in the same spot and new sneakers with new dirt pressed into the soles. Exhale. I am the same in this soul. Thank you. And everyone who submitted is a winner, uh, but there was one uh, person that was selected for first place. So our first place, a winner for 2020, is Mother's Medicine, Anita Satston. Hi, I'm Anita Stassen, and this is Mother's Medicine. My mother taught me to lick my wounds, so by the time the sun had cooled, I was fresh, and pain a weak aftertaste. My mother taught me resilience only rebounds so far, until it's merely jumping on cracked pavement, knees knocking in the solidity of it all. Oh, how the bones broke, chipped among smudged remains of a chalk-drawn dream. And I laid myself down to sleep that night. No mother, no moon. A simple prayer that tomorrow I would breathe and the breath would come sweet like spools of magic down the lungs. My mother, she would have smiled at such ambition, gripped my hand like warm power, and drawn me into life. So the next portion of our program, we're actually ahead of schedule a little bit. Um, our seniors have the option of taking an internship uh, or doing a senior seminar, and the journalists have to do both, and the English ed people have to student teach. So what we're going to have now is our rigorous 
senior seminar teachers, Professor Dan Ritchie and Professor Billy Ching Zacher, share the senior the theses with us with some commentary from the students. The first uh, presentation, we're gonna go in alphabetical order, is by Sierra Bilby, and after it's over, we'll ask a question of her. Hi, I'm Sierra Bilby, and my paper is called Dillard and Paradox. The first paradox that marks her writing is the interplay between the finite and the infinite. Dillard writes often about the finiteness of time, humanity, and nature to show how even temporary things point to the beyond. One image that illustrates the paradoxical relationship is a story Dillard hears of a blind girl regaining her sight after cataract surgery and seeing the tree with the lights in it. When Dillard goes searching for this tree, she finds it in her backyard cedar that is one second a normal tree and the next second on fire with lights. Annie Dillard describes the experience as less like seeing than like a being for the first time seen. Dillard finds herself seen by something transcendent, illustrating how the finite leads to the infinite. Another dissonant worldview that Annie Dillard explores is the role of the creator in creation. Dillard wonders if the relationship of the creator is distant or personal, but is limited by her own human access to this creator. While cre creation is the medium she engages with most directly, Dillard turns to general revelation and divine hiddenness to shape her understanding of the creator. With knowledge that she cannot access the creator backwards through the paradox, it falls on her to posture herself in creation according to the information she is given. She challenges her readers to observe what is revealed and pursue what is concealed as a way to access relationship with the creator. The last paradox asks questions about the character of creation, and subsequently the character of the creator. Dillard wonders if creation is ultimately good or evil, suggesting the irreconcilable idea that perhaps the creator is both malevolent and benevolent. To connect opposing forces, Dillard suggests two bridges between the good and the bad. For the bad, Dillard experiences in the good she laments. For the good Dillard finds in the bad, she gives thanks. The cycle of lament and thanksgiving creates an unending paradox between good and evil. This conveys the true lasting benefit of reading Dillard's work, learning how to live into dissonant ideas, realities, and worldviews. Thanks very much, Sierra. This is a question that comes from Rebecca. Sometimes Annie Dillard conveys her knowledge of God by exploring the beauty of his works in the world. It's called the Via Positiva, but at other times, her explorations uncover profound mysteries that tell her what God is not, the Via Negativa. Did one of these approaches prove to be the more congenial path for her works as a whole? That's a great question. Um, well, obviously both are prevalent in her writing. I actually think that the via negativa or the pursuit of hiddenness is more prevalent. Um, in her work, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, she structures the whole book by looking at both, but she ends by looking at the via negativa. She actually encourages her readers to uh, not only follow God up into the gaps um, or up into the hiddenness, the unknowability, um, but she encourages them to go there themselves and explore the unknown. Thank you, thanks very much. The next presentation will be that of Maddie Christie. Hi, my name is Maddie and my research was titled A Content Analysis of Rachel Held Evans' Impact Through Her Virtual Community of Faith. For those of you who don't know, Rachel Held Evans was an author, blogger, theologian in the progressive Christian world um, who died about a year ago. So this project was centered around mapping the specific impact Evans had on our community through analyzing tweets that came out after her death. The specific research question that was focused on was, what were the distinctive components of the long lasting impact Rachel Held Evans' life, work, and ministry had on her virtual community of faith? specific hashtag analyzed was because of RHE and there were a couple different methods of paring down the 15,000 tweets that were in that hashtag. Um, the full data set ended up being 1,452 tweets and in those tweets nine narrative themes were identified. Those nine themes were unfavorable, tweets that had a critical opinion about Rachel Held Evans' life and work, grief, um, her platform, how she shared her platform and championed others, action that she spurred others onto, like ministry or seminary, her inclusivity, helping people keep faith or get back to the church, 
freeing her followers in some way from ideas, doubts, um, encouraging or expressing her own doubts, and referencing the community that she built. And you can see the breakdown here of the number of tweets and what percentage of the total those came in. And these are listed in descending order from most to least. So you can see the top few there. And the results that this produced were that Rachel Held Evans' biggest impacts on her community were a radical inclusiveness, accepting and encouraging doubts, and helping our followers keep faith in God or faith in the church. Um, Maddie, this is a question from Tatiana. Through your research, have you found any other platform followers of Evans that continue to draw back to her as a role model? If so, how would you uh, describe these followers? Yeah, so I think Rachel Held Evans' impact is really interesting because it's lived on past her death in really tangible ways. So I think a lot of times when we see celebrities who have died or passed away, there's an outpouring of love and support initially that fades away pretty quickly. Um, in Rachel Held Evans' case, that hashtag, uh, because of RHE, is still pretty active um, every day, and especially lately, um, kind of marking this one-year time period since her death. Way more people have been coming on and sharing even more stories even a year later about how her impact has lived on. So one of the big things in that study was that um, she encouraged people to write books and start blogs and go to seminary. So I think one of the ways her impact really lives on is that other people are still stepping into new work because of her encouragement. And so her platform is continuing on through all these other people who she helped encourage and push into new work. Thank you, Maddie. And the next presentation goes to Diana. Hi, my name is Diana Clark and I looked at John Steinbeck's East of Eden. John Steinbeck uses biblical allusions specifically regarding the archetypes of Cain and Abel to provide commentaries surrounding the human condition of choice in the battle of good versus evil. Steinbeck argues that this story matters because the story of Cain and Abel is everybody's story, because it demonstrates the never-ending contest in ourselves of good versus evil. The Abel archetype takes a supporting role in his own death, it can be described as someone who can't help what they do. And as one scholar puts it, they're following their genetic code. In other words, able characters do good because that's all they know how to do. The Cain archetype is the one that Steinbeck puts the most weight into and develops his ideas off of. This archetype can be characterized as the Cain characters acting out of a violent manner, which confronts them with a choice to overcome evil and choose good. The Cain characters have to acknowledge that there is a battle between good and evil to be able to choose good. Steinbeck perpetuates this narrative following the archetypes through two families for three generations. Steinbeck uses the Hebrew word timshel, which means thou mayest, to discuss the stance of man's choice, because whereas there is thou mayest, there is also thou mayest not. Cal is the epitome of what Steinbeck is suggesting, along with his idea of timshel, Despite growing up believing he is evil because of his genetic makeup, he acknowledges that good versus evil exists and is able to overcome it. The reason that Cal becomes the face of Tim Shell when every other Cain archetype fails to do so is because of this concept of refiring. This gives each man in every generation the option to choose good over evil. This also explains how we're not always killing our brothers. What started as a moral lesson for his sons, Steinbeck turned East of Eden into his most important work. Transcending above just his sons, Steinbeck sheds light on the battle of good versus evil through the activation of the Bible next to his novel. Thanks, Diana. If someone is unfamiliar with the Cain and Abel story, what can they still gain from the novel and what will they miss? Or to put it another way, how does knowing the biblical archetype enrich and deepen the novel? Those who are reading the novel without any context of the Cain and Abel story and the Bible um, can still read the novel and get something out of it. However, um, the biblical archetypes really enrich the understanding of the novel and the characters um, significantly because it places the text of East of Eden next to the text of the Bible. Um, specifically with the stories of Cain and Abel and those archetypes, it 
by activating those two text, texts next to each other, it is um, also activating the past, the present, and the future or lack thereof of those characters that get perpetuated. So readers that are familiar with them would be able to um, deduct and have insight into how those characters are, where they've come from, and more importantly, where they're going in the stories. Um, if the reader is not familiar with the Bible, they're only giving the, given the understanding that Steinbeck develops for them, which can have you know, bias and um, it helps them or it causes them to miss out on the larger commentary that connects the characters to this larger theme of Tim Shell, which is what Steinbeck um, uses to clarify human condition related to choice and humans ability to have free will. Very good, thank you, thanks so much. Uh, now we'll go on to the uh, presentation by Hunter Hill. Hi, my name is Hunter Hill and the title of my project is The Eternal One, Emerson and Hindu Spirituality. So when many Americans think of Ralph Waldo Emerson, they tend to associate him with things characteristic of New England in the 19th century, um, things like Harvard University, the Unitarian Church, the Transcendentalist Movement, and the sort of pure American sense of individualism. Um, he's considered a staple of Western tradition, and accordingly, emphasis in Emerson scholarship is often placed on his Western influences. But if we take a closer look at his writings and spiritual ideas, Emerson's thought seems to have at least as many roots in Hinduism uh, as in the Western traditions with which he's most often associated. Uh, this Hindu influence was spawned largely by his reading of some of the great Hindu texts that were available in English translation at the time, including the Bhagavad Gita, the Karta Upanishad, and the Vishnu Purana. In Emerson's writings, there are, I suggest, four primary concepts through which we can most clearly see Hindu influences. The first is his concept of the Oversoul, which connects closely with the Hindu concepts of Atman, the transcendent self, and Brahman, the ultimate substratum of reality. The second is his concept of illusion, the idea that the world and its diversity prevent us from seeing the true interconnected nature of things. Uh, this finds a direct parallel in the Hindu concept of Maya, which is often translated from Sanskrit as illusion. Third is Emerson's idea of fate, which draws on the Hindu concept of karma and incorporates their belief in the transmigration of souls or rebirth. And finally, there's Emerson's concept of illumination or spiritual liberation, whose Hindu counterpart is moksha, implying a release from the cycle of rebirth. Um, so ultimately, studying these Hindu influences, which had a profound effect on his worldview, um, can give us a deeper, more contextualized understanding of Emerson's work and his spiritual imagination. And here's a nice quote I'll leave you with. Thank you. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, here's a question from Sierra. Uh, do you believe that Emerson was fully immersed in the Hindu theological worldview that you've been describing? or? Would you call it more of one inspiration among many that he drew from? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, because if you look at um, some of the scholarship uh, on Emerson, um, you can definitely see that um, there were also a lot of Western influences uh, in his writing, particularly um, like idealist sort of uh, orientations um, like German idealism, thinkers like uh, Hegel and Kant, and some uh, English idealists as well. Um, but as I argue in my um, project, uh, there are many concepts that seem to be central to kind of his spiritual imagination um, and kind of his theological worldview um, that very closely and sometimes um, explicitly like, approximate um, some Hindu concepts, um, so like the ones that I mentioned, um, uh, particularly the Oversoul, which he refers to as the Eternal One, um, kind of uh, implying this sort of non-dual uh, understanding of God and ultimate reality that's really present in like um, mainstream Hindu philosophy. Very good, thank you. Now we're going to go on to the presentation by Joe Heaty.
Hello, my name is Joe Heady. I did my research paper on the United States media coverage of the 2016 Olympics. For some background, the Olympics often do not turn a profit for the host city or host country. Uh, the Olympics are kind of seen as a spotlight uh, in the eyes of the media. Oftentimes, countries will host the Olympics because they want to rebrand or re-image themselves. Uh, in the case of Rio, many promises were made to help those who are living in poverty. A statement was made that every dollar spent on Olympic arenas Another five would be spent on local infrastructure and to help with affordable housing. Uh, it is also important to note that in the months leading up to this, uh, to these games, the Zika virus was at its height. It was being examined by the World Health Organization on whether or not they should delay the games, but it was deemed not a threat prior to the games being held. There were four major U.S. publications that I used to collect data. Uh, while using Bethel's library database, the keywords Rio Olympics were used to collect uh, was used to collect 102 different articles. Um, the only articles that I used in my data set were articles that were related to socioeconomic issues. My research question, did the media in the United States do an accurate job of reporting different socioeconomic issues that plagued the city of Rio de Janeiro in 2016? Uh, as for my results, there were several topics that were mostly covered throughout the data, the Zika virus, Rio's financial crisis, infrastructure, and stories about the citizens of Rio. The U.S. publications that were examined for this research paper did not accurate, accurately represent the many issues that were plaguing the city of Rio and often reported more on topics like the Zika virus, even though stories of citizens in Rio were, were a little bit more moving and showed more of what was going on inside the city. Uh, as for my conclusion, the two photos I have on the right are the reasons why I wanted to look into this issue. Um, that's the current uh, standings of the Olympic arenas that were built for the 2016 Games. Um, those arenas, to be built, they had to evict about uh, a couple thousand families uh, so they could build them. They also destroyed a nature preserve so they could build the Olympic golf course. Um, there was overall a lot of issues that were plaguing these games in the city of Rio that could have been covered but were chose not to. Um, the Zika virus was the biggest one and it was reported a month after in one article by the New York Times, not covered by any other um, publication that I looked into that nobody from the games actually uh, was infected with the Zika virus at all. So the issue that received most of the coverage was deemed the least amount of threat even though things like poverty still plagued the city. Um, so that was the overall gist of my research paper. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day. Good, Joe. Um, Maddie has a question for you. After this research, do you believe that the Olympics should not be hosted in developing countries in order to eliminate socioeconomic strains on these countries? Or do you think the media should just do a better job of covering the socioeconomic issues faced by these developing countries? Uh, so the research that I did for this paper uh, really showed that countries that are not economically stable um, or are considered developing countries have more issues when hosting the Olympics uh, than countries that are considered developed. Uh, what I would say though is more so an issue with the or it's more so an issue with the Olympic model uh, and the fact that the Olympics do not turn a profit for any country that hosts it. Um, but personally, I believe that the Olympics should not be hosted in developing countries. Uh, but if they are, the media needs to do a better job of covering the socio socioeconomic issues within that country um, and host city. Thank you. And Jasmine Johnson's presentation is coming up. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and my project is about community journalism in search for an identity amidst mounting challenges. So the reason for my research was to find out how community newspapers have been responding to shifts in the news media industry surrounding corporate ownership, their role as truth bearers for democracy, and an increasingly virtual audience. My method for research was narrative analysis, and I took articles from state newspaper associations across the country. I used the time frame of January 1st, 2015 through May 23rd, 2020, uh, in order to capture a multitude of perspectives, and I ended up reading 137 articles from 23 press associations. And my main research question was, in light of the constantly changing news industry, how are community newspapers responding to the declining readership and digital divide? My findings were five common narratives that stretched between how newspapers are responding to the world today. Uh, first was the urgency of saving community journalism, uh, the maintenance of journalistic values, the balance of reader wants and needs, an increase in online advertising, as well as ideas on how to improve audience engagement. 
And in conclusion, community newspapers have many factors to consider when planning how to respond to the increasingly digital world today. And understanding these five common narratives can help readers know what to do when working in the field of community journalism or supporting their local newspaper. Um, thank you, Jasmine. And uh, Josh Towner has a question for you. And you are heading into community journalism right after graduation as a reporter for Alexandria Echo Press. Congratulations for this job. What do you think this research has, uh, uh, um, what do you think this research has better prepare you for this transition into the role of a community journalist? Yes, thank you. Um, I've learned about the importance of engaging the audience in the process just as much as the product. And I think we got a taste of that with the Clarion as well uh, in shifting from a print publication to a daily online news source this spring. Um, that idea of reader wants and needs is really important in balancing uh, lighthearted and uh, breaking news as well as uh, that trust and reliability uh, among readership is the most important uh, regardless of ownership or platform. Um, I found that to be true across the articles that I read because community journalism ultimately is a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, the community needs the newspaper to stay in the know, but the newspaper needs the community to know what to write about. Thank you. And Sam Johnson's presentation is coming up. Hi, my name is Sam, and I did my research project on the newspaper coverage of the NFL's Rooney Rule. For some brief background, in 2003, the rule was instituted after two civil rights lawyers pushed the NFL to have more minority head coaches in the league. The rule was named after former Steelers owner Dan Rooney, who championed many social justice causes, as well as headed up the NFL Diversity Committee, and it mandates that for every head coaching vacancy in the NFL, at least one minority candidate must be interviewed for the job. For the method of study, four newspaper, newspapers were selected, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and in Sports Illustrated between the years 2002 and 2020. 107 articles were pulled from a keyword search of Rooney Rule and Rooney Rule NFL on the library's databases um, for each of the newspapers. The research question I was trying to answer was how did the national newspapers frame the Rooney Rule saga in terms of moral and football related reasons? Um, the results, um, one, there were 132 total mentions of moral reasons, um, which included sub-factors of societal pressure and personal conviction. Societal pressure kind of meaning pressure from those outside the organization, whereas personal conviction, there were the moral thoughts of those inside the organization. There were 78 mentions of the societal pressure and only 53 of personal conviction. In terms of football-related reasons, um, 41 of the total 74 mentions mentioned winning, losing games. 24 mentioned whether a coach was liked or not liked by a player. Five mentioned a clash with other members of the organization, and four mentioned other. So in conclusion, the majority of the coverage of the Rooney Rule from these newspapers centered around societal pressure from people outside of the organization, as well as a fair majority of personal conviction from those inside. Um, the on-the-field results had relatively less of an impact on the job status of a head coach than those personal feelings coming from influential decision makers inside the franchise and outside voices um, from societal pressure. Thank you, Sam. Um, Jared has this question for you. The ex, uh, explosion of digital publications is likely to increase the agenda setting effects. Do you think this development will make Rooney Rule play a more important role in the NFL moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think definitely the explosion of more digital platforms that we're seeing now in 2020 um, will have a huge impact on, on the Rooney Rule because uh, my, my study showed that even with four newspapers, that being four prominent papers, uh, there was a massive amount of coverage on uh, the Rooney Rule. And I, and, and I noticed even just like it was in 2003 when the rule was instituted, there's just as much today. And, and I think, you know, the NFL being such a popular sport as it is and the coaches being kind of a nice discussion platform that newspapers can take. I think there's always going to be head coaching vacancies and just the fact that you add more digital platforms. I think the Rooney rule and, and its effects are going to just expand as, as the years and as the popularity increases for the sport. Thank you, Sam. And Tatiana's paper is coming up. 
Hi, my name is Tatiana Lee. My research was titled The Framing of Sports-Related Concussions in Newspaper Editorials, a Qualitative Study. This research paper analyzes themes regarding sports-related concussions due to the editorial's framing of the topic. The purpose of this study is to gain a better understanding of sports concussions through the usage of various lenses, organizations, and individuals. The study introduces the idea that through editorials, more opinion is given on concussions and how they should be dealt with. My research questions are, why do journalists use editorials when writing about sports-related concussions? And my second one is, what are the most common framing theories when writing about sports-related concussions? For this study, there were a total of 474 editorials found through the ProQuest database used through Bethel University's library. The search keywords were sports concussion. While looking through the data set, Articles that were conducted for the study had to be editorials in the range of years of 2000 to 2020 and discussing the sports related concussion in the appropriate context and were nationwide. The total findings concluded to 168 articles. The outlining two headings that were selected for the framework that came out of the editorials were precaution and prevention. These are the two main themes discussed in the study's findings. Under both themes are subheadings, which give context to either precautions of concussions or ways to help prevent concussions. In conclusion, the study provided further insight into two main framing themes in editorials on the matter of sports concussions. When discussing precautions, the study addressed prior information on concussions such as assessments, treatments, and awareness. Discussing prevention, the study analyzed how to prevent by educating, beginning with the youth, and the dangers of long-term effects if not taken seriously. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, Jasmine has a question for you. Given your background knowledge on sports concussions, why do you think it's important for a broader audience who may not have any uh, connection to sports concussions to understand how journalists have framed this topic? Yeah, so um, the framing of this topic shows the relevance of the importance of sports concussions. And while the paper is predominantly about sports concussions, it can provide insight on general concussions as well. And when looking at the broader audience, um, something to look at is that whenever we go places, we'll understand that someone else there might have gone through a concussion or is also going through a concussion. Um, so the study aims to give awareness so that individuals may be more educated on this topic and to spread more awareness. And then lastly, a uh, factor which plays in is collegiate sports. I believe the recognition from professors, coaches, and students is impactful when discussing concussions because it narrows down the abilities of the individuals um, during this time of life. Thank you, Tatiana. And uh, the next presentation is from Bethany. I'm Bethany Lopez Luna, and my project is titled Mad Men and Medical Miracles, the Role of Doctors in 19th Century Literature. Medical professionals in 19th century literature are used as a device to explore, criticize, and validate social anxieties, particularly those involving the rapid change of medical technologies and methodologies, uncertain ethical boundaries in medicine, and the shifting of many social roles. Today, doctors are generally well respected and trusted with the general public, especially in these unusual times. To become a doctor, a person needs years of schooling and exams and needs to be registered with the proper boards. The procedures for a checkup are consistent, effective, professional, and maintain the patient's privacy. These standards were much lower in the 1800s, a time when the profession was rife with quacks and unqualified doctors, treatments could be as damaging as the disease, and the profession as a whole was not held in high regard. One area literature looks at in regards to doctors is discerning the moral boundaries needed to show proper respect to their patients as people and not disrupt the natural order. American author Nathaniel Hawthorne explores this aspect in a few of his short stories, where mad doctors attempt to assert themselves over natural aspects of life, 
such as aging and physical imperfection and in the process irrevocably damage or kill those close to them. Hawthorne was just one of several authors that used their works as a way of calling out and questioning a flawed and largely unchecked system. Literature allowed these anxieties about the field to be made public and therefore spur change. Towards the end of the century, doctors did begin to gain more respect as they responded to criticism and altered their practices and registration requirements. The 19th century was a dark era for medical professionals, but through literature, the field was unable to ignore its inherent flaws and therefore work towards a more respectable, more stable future in medicine. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, here's a question uh, originally from Hunter. What's the most important thing that Hawthorne's mad doctors can tell us about the practice of medicine today? Sure. So how I see it is I believe that Hawthorne's stories of mad doctors really act as a reminder of how far public perception of the field has come in these past 200 years. The mad doctor trope still exists in fiction today, but more as a tried and true archetype rather than a social critique as it was at the time of Hawthorne's writing. Uh, the level of respect between now and then towards the medical field is really night and day. And I see Hawthorne's stories as really helping to explain the fears that were going on in that very challenging time. And also to recognize the work that had to go into improving the field to gain the level of public trust that we see today. Very good, thank you. Now we're gonna go on to Jared's presentation. I'm Jared Martinson, and this is my paper on ownership and content, authentic brands groups takeover of Sports Illustrated. A little bit of background on this topic. Uh, over the last decade, private equity companies have bought a lot of struggling newspapers and other written publications across the country to keep them afloat. And this new ownership typically pursues a business model that values quantity over quality and will often cut costs, including uh, lots of newsroom staff, which was the case in with Sports Illustrated, uh, the most iconic sports magazine of the last half century. Uh, and both of those uh, actions by this new ownership weigh heavy after SI's sale to Authentic Brands Group in October of 2019. Breaking down uh, Twitter reactions in response to this sale was uh, part of my method for analyzing uh, this data. How did readers respond to new ownership turning over SI's identity and content model? So 372 tweets containing the hashtag SaveSI uh, were analyzed, and these tweets occurred from October 3rd, 2019, the announcement of the uh, sale of Sports Illustrated to October 10th, 2019, one week after that. Uh, they were categorized into four against or unknown uh, categories regarding the sale uh, with some more subcategorical reasoning later on. And Save SI was a rallying cry for people against uh, the sale, but also an opportunity for people that were supportive of it to join the conversation with reactions from the opposite perspective. A couple results of this study show that 310 of these 372 Save SI tweets were against the sale of Sports Illustrated. Uh, a couple prominent reasons for that were SI losing its identity as a sports journalism icon and grief and empathy toward the talented journalists that were laid off in this new direction, uh, being replaced by freelance contractors that often did not have much experience. So of these reactions supporting SI, supporting SI's sale, uh, a majority did believe the business model and print-based subscription idea would not last uh, in today's uh, media world. And private media companies and hedge funds do have a track record of overtaking and redirecting these publications. But the overwhelming negative reactions to the sale of Sports Illustrated via this hashtag indicate that it, just because it might be a sensible business decision, it doesn't mean it is a morally wise choice uh, at the stake of losing these readers and laying off talented journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. And uh, Joe Heedy, uh, Joe has this question for you. Given your knowledge of the hedge funds buyout of the Sports Illustrated, do you think that the Sports Illustrated or other sports publications could return to its old model of operation or are readers destined for a quantity over quality style of journalism? 
I would expect most hedge funds and other private media companies to uh, continue this trend of turning these financially struggling publications over for some kind of short-term profit, uh, however they can, regardless of the popularity uh, and profile of the publications that they're buying. Uh, in my data set, I had a substantial percentage of the responses that were in support of the sale. I uh, believe that the old business model uh, was unsustainable, and I'd predict that any new ownership uh, of a publication like that will follow those numbers to pursue some kind of content farm model that forces quantity over quantity, over quality, uh, just like authentic brands did to the Sports Illustrated. So it, it would, I would assume that, especially in sports media, the best way to gain traffic is to have opinion pieces, hit pieces, clickbait, so to speak. Uh, and that's what Sports Illustrated's online presence has become while cutting back on its print uh, style. So I would assume that that'll continue to be the trend moving forward for sports media. Thank you. And Rebecca's uh, presentation is the next. Rebecca Nuccio and my project is titled Motherhood is Incompatible with Slavery, Reflections on the Maternal in Toni Morrison's book Beloved. Toni Morrison's book Beloved is not simply a book about slavery with a capital S, but rather it is a book that handles extensively the suffering, resilience, and creativity of slave mothers, about how a community enslaved makes sense of its enslavement through the strength of family and community. Beloved is a book about what these men, women, and children enslaved needed to do in order to move forward. Morrison does not tell Margaret Gardner's story or paint such a vivid picture of the lives of slaves to make people feel guilty or angry, but to provide a window into how slaves at the time lived their lives, to give insight into what they were willing to risk and how far they were willing to go in order to connect with and understand one another. Despite the ways in which mothers often try to circumnavigate their children's enslavement, in this book and in that time, some mothers through circumstance or choice stayed and lived with their children in captivity. Through the demands and ordeals of slavery, many mothers resorted to a form of mothering that includes multiple mothers and the caretaking of children. This form of mothering is called shared mothering or other mothering. We see evidence of this through the character of Baby Suggs and Beloved. Though Baby Suggs is Setha's mother-in-law, she stands as the mother figure and stabilizing force in Setha and Denver's life. Other mothering prevailed during the time of slavery and existed both within the slave community, where sl caretaking of slave children fell into the hands of community, and in the slave master and mistress's home, where the captor's children were cared for by the slave mother. The women who did stay in slavery to care for their children often found a tremendous amount of joy and happiness in bringing up their child. Through forms of other mothering and sharing child rearing duties with their children, these mothers instilled in their children a sense of responsibility for the community and others in the family. Thanks very much, Rebecca. You noted in your paper something that Haley picks up on in a question for you. Other mothering on a slave plantation included the relation of slave mothers to the owner's babies. They breastfed them and cared for them. Did they bond with those children as well? Did they come to love them too, despite their parents? Uh, yeah, so um, wet nursing, um, so other mothering is defined as like I said in the video, um, African American women offering maternal assistance to the children of other mothers who don't actually belong to them. And wet nursing um, at this time was seen as a form of gendered exploitation for enslaved women because their bodies were being used as a form of labor. Um, but because of the very small amount of source material that I found um, available on the subject, I think that wet nursing is a bit hard to quantify. Um, and I think that personally, it, historians can employ like um, a form of co compassion and humanity to explore the lives of these women. And I think that um, motherhood at that time was a form of culturally, like it was a, it was a culturally variable relationship where one individual nurtures and cares for another. So I think in this prism, motherhood has moved beyond this idealized conception um, where motherhood is a private domestic phenomenon. So I can definitely see um, other mothers caring for children who are not their own just simply because of this broader definition of motherhood that includes more than one mother caring for another child. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, we're going to continue with Haley's presentation. My name is Haley Sawyer, and my senior project is titled From Keats to Carr, Virtual Poetry in the 21st Century. In recent decades, technological advances have offered an entirely new platform for poetry readership to gain notoriety through the mobile phones billions of individuals carry with them every single day. Podcasting was developed in 2004, a radio-like audio platform in which various hosts publish audio recordings. There are dozens of poetry podcasts, such as The Slowdown, a five-minute daily audio publication hosted by Tracy K. Smith, who reads new, simple poems by millennial artists that are accompanied by soft music. The Daily Poem is an audio anthology of classic, well-known poetry, released daily and highlighting artists like Thomas Merton and Emily Dickinson. Listening to poems through audio podcasts offers a new layer for fans of poetry. Rather than reading a poem on paper, they're hearing emotion evoked through another's voice, making the experience more intimate. In addition to podcast poetry, social media outlets too have expanded the opportunity for new readership. Artists like R.M. Drake and Ruby Carr generate a large portion of their readership on social media platform Instagram. Instagram photos are small dimensional squares that are posted to one's profile in a laid out grid form. Because these square photos fit within the small screens of our mobile phones, poetic form has adapted itself into aesthetically pleasing, simple, and relatable free verse. Ruby Carr's grid is laid out in an intermittent fashion, alternating between photo and poem. She has over 4 million followers on Instagram alone. Almost always, her poems are accompanied with a small, simple graphic design. Fans can easily like, comment, and even repost these poems, all with the tap of a finger. R.M. Drake posts similarly aesthetically pleasing poems, many of which have been reposted to the profiles of celebrities like Kim Kardashian West, who has over 169 million followers. The true number of impressions these poems have made on readers is far too high to count. Virtual poetry, through podcasts and social media, connects millions of individuals to share their appreciation for poetry. Thank you, Haley. This is a question from Diana. Your project has shown that poetry has become more accessible technologically. Has that forced the poets who use this technology to make their poetic language more accessible too? Maybe simpler or perhaps even less rich? Yeah. So poets are definitely simplifying their writing into more easily digestible pieces that um, people can just scroll through on their phones. Um, so artists are straying away from more concrete traditional poems like haiku or villanelle and they're writing in um, unmetered free verse. And a lot of contemporary poets like uh, Rupi Carr and R.M. Drake, who I featured in my presentation, will write with no capitalization um, and often use minimal punctuation as well to make their writing as simple as possible. Thank you very much. And our last presentation for the afternoon is by Josh Towner. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The space race in the 1950s and 1960s boiled down to a competition between NASA, the United States space program, and the Soviet Union's cosmonaut program. The Soviets were the first to put a probe, Sputnik, into space, the first to put a living animal, this dog Laika, into space, and the first to put this guy Yuri in space. But they didn't quite get to the moon first. This brings us to 1969, and the way the New York Times reported on the space race that year. Spirits weren't exactly high for either country at the start of the year, as a holdup in Soviet space work was announced in January, and a February report from a NASA aide and low poll numbers brought down American morale. But in May, NASA's trip to the moon was all but official. The United States was primed to win the space race. This led to a boom in the space industry. Well, the space toy market, that is. Aerospace stocks still weren't profitable, even on July 17th, the day of the launch. 
Thousands of Americans gathered in Central Park to watch as Neil Armstrong took his small step onto the lunar surface, despite a rainstorm turning the park into a swamp. Overwhelmingly positive reports flooded in, rocketing American nationalism to a new apex. Some even compared the moon landing to an event of biblical proportions. But as the year carried on, people's excitement began to fade. Even though Apollo 12 took a voyage to the moon, people preferred to watch Johnny Carson or the New York Knicks to the second landing, which, hey, Walt Frazier was in the Big Apple at that time. By the year's end, conspiracy theories about a faked moon landing began to emerge, mainly based off of similarities in the photos of the moon landing site and a training site in New Mexico. The final piece published in the Times in 1969 was about astronauts moving on from space, as if to symbolize the American public's shifting interests and a return to normalcy. Thank you, Josh. That was, that was quite fun to look at that. Um, so we got a question from Sam. You mentioned that after the moon landing took place, there was a growing public sentiment questioning the validity of the event. Do you think the anticipation of the landing, the space race against the Soviet Union and the landing itself became overshadowed by the questioning and skepticism after the fact? Uh, I think, I mean, the fact that we're here uh, a half century later, and I can still do a research paper on the moon landing, um, kind of is a proof that the skepticism didn't overshadow public sentiment uh, surrounding the moon landing. Um, I think I, I included that coverage uh, more to show that the Times covered uh, every possible avenue in the year, um, instead of being just one-sided and only celebrating the moon landing. Um, and I don't, I don't think that that uh, branch of conspiracy theorists um, really contributed to a viable public sway in uh, the opinion of the space race. Thank you. All right, let's hear it for our presenters. All right, so we're gonna finish with Professor Dan Ritchie giving us some words that'll send us off. Get us ready for Thank graduate. Much, students. Uh, this has been a, a great pleasure to, to see. Uh, one of the things I'm gonna miss about graduation is the parade of shoes that passes by on the platform. Platform, shoes on the platform. Um, I try to sneak a, a picture of the most outrageous ones. And uh, the second faculty row uh, up there on the platform is the best vantage point. Well, students, you're soon saying goodbye to an institution that has sought to shape you in certain ways over four formative years of your lives. And institutions have a bad reputation these days, whether it's our political or our religious ones, the media or education. In his recent book, A Time to Build, Yuval Levin explains that Americans used to understand institutions as molds, formative molds to shape individuals. We used to accept the notion that we poured ourselves into our family, our community organizations, our church, work, union, and school, and we began to take on that institution's shape. And that shape, in turn, enabled us to live freely and to work effectively in our communities. Bethel's Covenant outlines the shape to which this community aspires, and its mission follows from that shape. The English department has its own shape, and teachers like Chris Weiss and Jerry Healy shaped it, along with Janine Bollmeyer, who passed away earlier this year, and her longtime colleague, Lorraine Idle. The curricula in our majors contribute decisively to this mold, along with our signature programs, such as the Coeval, the Clarion, Opportunities in January term in New York, the Johnson Center in England term. But we're often told today that the most admirable character is not one who has accepted a mold, but someone who's broken the mold. Not someone who understands his or her role in terms of the institutions of which we're a part, but someone who develops his or her own platform. 
Rather than shaping individuals, institutions are increasingly viewed as mere platforms for shaping your brand, broadcasting your message. The underlying assumption is that individuals are already free. They don't require formation. Just compare the connotations of institutional religion with my spirituality, and you get the point. Now, social media platforms can be used in ways that serve institutional and communal purposes, but we all know the other examples and perhaps the temptations of the outraged flame, the cancel culture, painless virtue signaling that substitutes for authentic service. Platforms used like this don't build flourishing communities. Now we've largely been isolating ourselves from our communities for two months by coronavirus, but haven't we been isolating ourselves from the sources of true community for a much longer time? Well, in our literature classes, we've taught you how to receive the words of poets and novelists. In our writing classes, you've been molded by collaboration and even criticism. You journalists have learned how to receive words from interviewees and from editors. And in your internships and student teaching positions, you've been molded by mentors. When Jesus sought followers, he wasn't talking about Twitter. He was talking about discipleship. He said that knowing the truth would make us free, but knowing that truth came from keeping his word, being molded by his word. You're leaving this institution to join other institutions, whether that's in your paid work or in the rest of your life, in teaching, in media, the church, in new families and community organizations. So let's leave the shoes on the platform and walk into your new roles. Our very life as a community depends on it. Thank you for being our students and God bless you. Thanks, Professor Ritchie. And now is not the time for goodbyes uh, or for virtual hugging or anything like that. We'll do that at graduation with our seniors. And after um, graduation happens, we'll have a post-graduation celebration on Zoom. You will get that invite very soon from Susie Nelson. I also want to let you know that if you want to uh, have this presentation for yourself, please email me at s-winter at bethel.edu um, and I, I will share it with you and you can show it off to your parents, show off your videos to your hairdressers, to your uh, taxidermists, to anybody you wish. Um, and that's about it. I want to thank uh, Yuli Ching Zocker, Dr. Yuli Ching Zocker and uh, Dr. Dan Ritchie for doing most of the legwork and making this happen, and for all my, my, my colleagues for helping make this happen. But ultimately, this is not a celebration of them. This is a celebration of you guys and your big ideas that we saw in your poems, that we saw in your research papers, that we've seen from you in classes uh, for the last four years, unless you're Jasmine or somebody like that who only stayed with us for three and gave up one year of eligibility. So we hope to see you on graduation. Uh, please reach out to us if you need anything between now and then. Uh, but you got to give us time to grade. That's all Susan Brooks wants to do. So thanks for being here, and we'll see you later. Good job, guys. Congratulations. You can turn on your mics. Let's hear it one more time for the seniors. Woo! Uh, congratulations. Yay, congratulations. Good job, seniors. Congratulations, guys. Oh, yay. Yay. Good job. Good job. After graduation. <laughs>